All right. Welcome everyone to our book launch uh, today. We are presenting in partnership with The Spaniel Sale, an amazing new bookstore in Ottawa. And right now, I would like to ask Cole from The Spaniel Sale to say a few words. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name's Cole. I'm one of the owners of The Spaniel Sale Bookstore in Ottawa. Uh, as this is a virtual event, we're being joined today by people from all across the land, now known as Canada. At this time, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory upon which you are joining us and uh, reflect upon our collective responsibility to continue walking the shared path of reconciliation together. The Spaniel's Tale Bookstore is located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. We honor their long history on this land and we endeavor to uphold and uplift their voices. We're very pleased to join our friends at Renaissance Press for this virtual book launch. As Ottawa's newest independent bookstore, we've worked hard to curate a selection of great reads by local and Canadian authors, as well as writers from around the world. We opened in September of this year, and three months later, we now have nearly 3,500 different titles in store and access to over 11 million titles through our website. Of course, five of those titles are the great ones that we're celebrating today. We're pleased to join with Renaissance to support these Ontario-based authors, and with that, I will turn it back over to Nathan to get things started. Thank you so much for that introduction, Cole. Um, uh, obviously, uh, everyone here today, I would strongly encourage you to get all of your books from The Spaniel's Tale. They have all of the books that we are launching today available on their website, and I will be posting links directly to the website in the chat here. Um, and for those watching on Facebook, I will also be adding those links in the comments on Facebook. So the first book we are launching today is a book by an author team, actually, local authors, Jen and Eric Desmarais, um, who have been helping each other writing projects since 2006. It took a worldwide pandemic for them to realize how much less effort it would be if they worked on the same thing. I wish they did. This is surprising since they have been collaborating on business projects for several years under the generic design name. They currently are planning several more interconnected novels, short stories, and who knows what else. They, again, live in Ottawa, Canada with their two children and several thousand books. The books they're launching today is called Assassins, Accidental Matchmakers. And the book is just as fun as the title makes it out to be. Now we'll hand it over to them to tell you a little bit about the book. And, um, oh, actually, I wanted to show you a trailer of the book. Kennedy Fairfield just graduated in the class of 2002 and is now trying to find her purpose in life or at least a job in her field. When she saves Jason Johnson, the leader of a secret community of supernatural people called Etherborn, they embark on a whirlwind epic romance and adventure. For Kennedy and Jason to discover why people are disappearing in time to save her friends. They'll have to face teleporting assassins. Grumpy wizards. Gossiping hags. Mafia robots. And secret military groups. All in the city of Westmeath, Ontario, which has more secrets than residents. Assassins, Accidental Matchmakers by Jen and Eric Demare. Awesome. So Jen and Eric, um, you're going to perform a little bit of, of reading for everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan, for that awesome trailer. Yeah. And I, I want to point out, just to embarrass, that Jen composed and performed the music. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're reading from chapters seven and eight. And uh, the two main characters are Kennedy and Jason. Jason has an alter ego, uh, as a reader, you know that, but she doesn't, called uh, the Phantom. They've had one very intense date. <laughs> and she is currently being attacked, and this mysterious man in black appears to save her, and they've just figured out that the uh, people attacking her are after the hair clip that she is wearing. They raced down two flights before they heard the door above them open again and voices echoing off the concrete walls. Stay away from the inside edge, 
the man cautioned at a whisper. How much further? Kennedy panted. We're heading for my bike on level two parking. The man readjusted his grip on her hand and kept running. Do you know how to drive a motorcycle? No, she squeaked. I'm driving it? It's easier to fight if I'm not driving. They reached the bottom and he yanked open the door. Have you driven an ATV or four-wheeler? Yes, she blinked as her eyes adjusted to the dimness of the parking garage after the bright stairwell. Hang on, he said, pulling her into a shadowy corner. We'll let them pass us, he whispered. The shadows gathered around them as he boxed her in. Chest heaving, Kennedy tried to catch her breath. She rested her head against his chest and slowly started doing up the buttons on her shirt, counting as she went. She inhaled deeply and her eyes widened, shocked. Another breath in through her nose, Musk and Jason mixing. No way, she thought. She glanced up at him, his jaw tense as he watched the door a few feet away his profile with half his hair tied up in a prony tail and the rest brushing his shoulders looked familiar. Her gaze drifted to his mouth and her lips tingled with the memory of the brief kiss they had shared. What should I call you? She asked, voice barely above a whisper. His lips quirked in an even more familiar half smile. I'm known as the Phantom of Westmeath. You can call me Phantom. It is him. Kennedy gaped at him. Then she remembered that she should respond. Nice to meet you, Phantom. My name is Kennedy. Thank you for saving my life multiple times back there. That's my job. His eyes never left the door. Where did you get that hairpiece? Well, I thought it came from Ezekiel's, but now I'm not so sure, Kennedy said, exasperated, pulling at the bobby pin that held it in place. She slid it into her purse. I have no idea how it ended up on my table. Hmm, mused the Phantom. Driving a motorcycle is similar to driving a four-wheeler. Gear shift, extra throttle. Don't worry, we'll walk you through it. We? Kennedy's head was spinning from the abrupt change in topic and the revelation of who the Phantom was. Shh, they're coming. The door slammed open and multiple beefy guys exited, guns up and ready. They spread out through the garage as the Phantom and Kennedy watched them. Then they signaled to each other and headed for jeeps and bikes. Hang on, the phantom murmured in her ear. We're going to shadow jump again. They hopped out at a pillar quite the distance away from their initial spot. Again, he whispered, and they were in a different spot. Last one. They were in the shadow of a pillar beside a sleek black motorcycle. Okay, that was super weird, but cool. Kennedy shakily took a step toward the motorcycle. You'll have to tell me how you do that sometime. The phantom opened one of the saddlebags and pulled out a basic helmet. Put your purse in there, he pointed at the large helmet hanging off the handlebar. That one is yours. V will help you with anything that might come up. Kennedy carefully put the purse with the supposed key into the bag and pulled the, the helmet on. I've got a dozen calls to the police. Something about gunfire and the Westmeath Phantom kidnapping a model? Sounds like that was a shit show, a voice said directly into her ear. You can say that again, sighed Kennedy. You're not the Phantom. I'm not. Kennedy replied. I'm Kennedy, the not-so-kidnapped model. You must be V. He said I had to drive. Of course he did, said V dryly. I hope you're ready because the cameras are picking up two jeeps and ten, no, eleven motorcycles heading your way. So that was the end of the chapter, and then this is jumping forward into his part. Where do I start? Right there. All right. The bike stalled, and he walked Kennedy through, starting it again. They accelerated way faster than either of them expected. The bike wobbled a little, and Kennedy turned right. If you're ready to go, turn left, or you'll be heading straight to, to them. And never mind, you're going straight at them. V had barely said Jeep when the Phantom saw the first coming towards them. It was followed by two racing bikes. Both bike riders had guns balanced on the handles and there yeah, on the handles, and the Jeep had a man standing on the back seat with a rifle. The Phantom could tell when Kennedy saw them because she accelerated. What are you doing? asked V. I have an idea. Phantom, do you trust me? Kennedy asked. Yes, he replied without hesitation. You know that teleporting thing you do? She trailed off as she struggled with the bike. Yes. Oh, that's cool, was his only reply. Have you ever done anything that big? asked V. The bike drove directly toward the Jeep. The driver took, looked worried, and the gunner was so surprised he forgot to shoot. 
The Phantom was impressed that Kennedy didn't waver. He waited until the bike was extremely close before he shifted them into the shadows and jumped behind the Jeep. The effort was more than he was used to, but he was able to recover fast enough to see that Kennedy hadn't slowed down and was aiming between the two bikes. They fired wildly, and he formed two long swords, one in either hand. As they passed, he sliced down on the back tires, and they went flying into the parked cars on either side. There are more coming from the front. Can you do that again? asked V. Probably. It wasn't as hard as I thought, he replied and smiled. Despite the danger, it was fun. There was an exit straight ahead, aiming straight into the setting sun. The sky was bright red and purple, but the sun was blinding. Kennedy turned toward the ramp going to up to the second level. There's no exit that way. What are you thinking? V sounded amused and worried. Kennedy was concentrating on not tr tipping the bike and didn't reply. She finally said, the roof is open air and I was thinking that we could lose them by jumping off. V whistled and said, I'm not sure if you're brave, reckless, or have way too much faith in the Phantom. I've never done anything this big before. I might be useless for a while after, the Phantom said, worried, but her confidence in him made him feel like he could do anything. The bike's tire was hit by one of the enemy energy balls. It did nothing but warn them that the Jeep was coming up fast behind. He sighed and said, I'll be jumping on and off. Try to keep control. He didn't wait for an answer and jumped onto the seat next to the gunman in the Jeep. Unlike the Andromeda Syndicate, when he punched the man's knee, it crunched and buckled. To the man's credit, he stayed up and tried to fight. His fist burst into bluish energy and he punched back. The punch sent the Phantom's entire body into convulsions. This man's hands are glowing and his fists feel like tasers, the Phantom said as he stood up and blocked another punch. He countered with a hard jab to the man's head and the man dropped like a rag doll. Taking the gun, he shot the driver with the energy weapon and jumped out back to the bike. He heard the jeep crunch into a concrete pillar. What kind of etherborn can do that? V asked. I've never heard of any. Something anime-based, maybe? Having gotten the bike under control again, after adding his weight to it, Kennedy asked, what's an etherborn? Long story, not the time. Be right back. They were on the fourth level, or five, and unfortunately they needed to cross the entire parking structure to get to the ramp to the fifth floor. Behind them were two bikes. He shadow jumped onto the back of one and said, who do you work for? The bikes were too loud in the concrete echo chamber of the parking garage and the man didn't hear him. The bikes were close enough together that the Phantom was able to make the Toki Kakaura again and use it as a crook, pulling the bikes dangerously close together. He jumped off them just as they started trying to pull away. The lack of pressure from him meant they overcompensated and went spinning wildly, knocking each other knocking two other bikes along the way. How'd they get in front of us? Kennedy asked. They must have gotten up the other ramp, V suggested. Between them and the ramp toward upward were three bikes, then a Jeep, and then two more bikes. The leading bike accelerated and the three front bikes, along with the Jeep's gunner, opened fire. The Phantom reached forward and made a shield to block the worst of the shots. Have you ever seen a knight's tale? Kennedy asked with with confirmation from both, she continued, joust the first guy. And that's where we're done. Awesome. Thank you so much for this reading. This was uh, very entertaining. Uh, Assassins, Accidental Matchmakers by Jen and Eric de Marais. Uh, make sure to grab your copy, <clears throat> sorry, from the Spaniel's Tale, either by walking into their Westboro Bookshop or by clicking the link that I put in the Facebook comments and in the Zoom chat. Up next, we have something entirely different. Uh, we have a new novel from Evan May. Evan May is a writer and history professor who lives in Ottawa, Canada. His master's and PhD in medieval history largely focused on scamps and troublemakers in 15th century England, and he now also writes down the strange things that live in his head. His first two novels, The King in Darkness and Bonhomme Setar, were also published by Renaissance Press. Today, Evan is going to read from Easter Pinkerton and the case of the heretic blood. Um, as you can probably tell from the structure of the title, this is a little bit of a, um, a callback to Sherlock Holmes. It is set in England 
in the 19th century. And I'm actually going to hand it over to Evan to tell us just a little bit more about Easter Pinkerton and the case of the heretic blood. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, just a little bit more about the book. It is, uh, in, in a lot of ways, um, my my ode to the Sherlock Holmes stories that I, I loved growing up. And um, the particular idea for this character and this story started with a town in Scotland that a friend of mine drove through. They drove through a town called Easter Pinkerton. And uh, we had a conversation about it later. And um, I said that that should be a character in a Victorian spy story. And they told me to write it. And so I did. And so this is what we ended up with. Um, it is the story of a lady spy against uh, an occult conspiracy in the late 19th century. Um, the little bit I'm going to read to you uh, today is, is towards the beginning. I think it gives you a, a pretty good flavor of uh, what Easter Pinkerton is like. Um, gives you a sense of this character who I, I started out thinking of as like a female version of James Bond, but in the 19th century. All right. Pinkerton paid her accumulated fare for the day and added a substantial gratuity. It occurred to her that she, if she gradually accumulated the goodwill of London's drivers, it was certainly no bad thing. Bidding the man a good evening, she lit a cigarette while she paused to orient herself and determine the direction of the mews where Williams, her coachman, would no doubt await her. This done, she flicked the match into the gutter and started on her way. A tall man in a long cloak stepped quite deliberately into Pinkerton's path. He wore a rather old-fashioned top hat and carried a long, gleaming stick that he used to prevent her stepping around him easily. Pinkerton stopped and fixed him with her coldest stare. This was likely to be some variety of rake or con man, thinking he had found a susceptible mark. Faced with firmness and a determination not to be intimidated or impressed, his people usually went in search of easier prey. This time, Pinkerton was mistaken. The man touched the brim of his hat and spoke just loudly enough for her to hear, your investigations stop tonight. Pinkerton could almost feel the wheels of her thought churning away at this sudden unexpected shift in the situation before her. I see, she said, and if they do not. The man's lean features flickered into a slight smile, and he pulled upwards on the ball of his stick, revealing for a moment a gleaming length of steel. A sword cane, then, and a threat that was direct enough. Pinkerton gauged the distance between them and took a judicious step back. I cannot oblige you, sir, she said flatly. Again, to her surprise, he said nothing else, merely jerked his weapon free of its sheath and flew at her. There were, no doubt, gasps and cries of surprise from the other people on the street, but Pinkerton thrust such considerations aside. This was not the moment to be concerned about the impressions of others. The man made two broad, sweeping strokes with the sword, more dramatic than dangerous, Pinkerton thought. She skipped back two more steps to avoid them and appraised her attacker. He was quick but poorly dressed for a fight, and a sword cane was more of a gentleman's amusement than a serious weapon. Perhaps he had been relying on intimidation. Perhaps he believed she offered no threat. Pinkerton drew out her knife and determined to disabuse him of the notion. She checked her retreat down the pavement. She had no clear recollection of the footing further back, and in any case, it was no longer necessary. She held the knife steadily, her thumb aligned with the blade, and waited for her opponent's next move. Perhaps seeing his target holding still, he planted one foot and made a fencer fencer's lunge, a move intended to make her back up again. Instead, she stepped lightly forward and lashed out one foot to strike the outside of his exposed knee, felt the joint buckle, and now it was time to rip upwards with the knife. Her opponent surprised her by throwing himself away from her, rolling tightly on the pavement into a crouch facing her again. Still, she knew her blow had done damage, and she pressed the advantage, making what appeared to be a reckless dash forward. Her attacker stood and ready to backhanded slash with his blade. Pinkerton took a step to the outside, glided forward in a manner that would have pleased her dancing master, and slashed with her knife at his wrist, the blade biting through fabric and flesh down to the bone. The sword cane clattered to the ground, and now it was her, turn her assailant's tail to back turn to backpedal out of the way of a follow-up that would have laid open his throat. His teeth flashed in a grimace of pain, or perhaps a smile, and he touched his hat again. Until the next time, madame, 
he said flatly, and then turned and dashed away. For a moment, Pinkerton was inclined to pursuit, but then she imagined being led into an ambush and thought better of it. She looked around to find herself surrounded by shocked onlookers who seemed to have no better idea what to make of her standing there knife in hand than they had been out of a sudden attack on a lady. She felt something wet and warm on her cheek, touched it with a finger that came away red. She smiled at an elderly couple watching her with ashen faces and wiped her enemy's blood off as daintily as she could with a handkerchief. First blood to me, I think, she observed cheerfully. However, she had clearly upset someone, provoking this clumsy attack. She must be closer to something than that someone would like. She would press her advantage, and her own stroke would be more deadly. The old man, however, had begun to fumble a police whistle out of his vest, and so it was evidently time to be gone. Her standing under the law would not be hazardous. She had merely defended herself against an attacker. But there might be questions to be answered about her concealed weaponry, which would lead to further, more delicate issues, and it was all best avoided. Pinkerton tried to select both the cut of her dresses and design of her boots to allow rapid movement when necessary, and she was able to find Williams and be safely away before the constabulary arrived. There might be an awkward story in the papers tomorrow, but Pinkerton reflected that there was likely to be a rich harvest of these if her investigation truly began to yield fruit. Pinkerton returned home without any further incident beyond consuming the last of her cigarettes. She dismissed Williams and rang for Yates, her butler, asking for a fire to be lit in the library, intending to chase down the various avenues of her thinking while the facts of the day were still fresh in her mind. You might bring me a cold plate there as well, please, she added, with a brief guilty pang for whatever dinner might have already been prepared. Of course, madam, at once, Yates replied, and if I may, madam, I believe your mother is in the small parlor planning her summer reception. I believe your advice would be most welcome. Pinkerton's answer seemed to come from the same unconscious place as the parries and repasts taught by her fencing tutor. I am sure, Yates, that my mother and her arrangements will be sufficient unto themselves, as always, she said. There was the smallest pause, and Pinkerton believed the minutest of winces before Yates's eminently proper bow and his response. Just as you say, madam. Then he very visibly did consider for a moment before continuing, one other small matter, if I might. Of course, Yates, Pinkerton answered. She presumed her butler took no offense at these instances, where the relationship of master and servant became suddenly rigid. In the moment, as she recognized she had no real basis for thinking this, she tried to construct a sufficient and acceptable addition that might convey apology, conciliation, gratitude, even affection. Yates cleared his throat slightly and said, Forgive me, madam, but there's blood on your dress again. Pinkerton felt a smile begin to wriggle into her expression, suppressed it, and gave a nod of acknowledgement. Thank you, Yates, she said. That will be all for now. She went up to her room, exchanged the battle-stained dress for a shirt and comfortable trousers, and, received, and retrieved her journal. By the time she descended to the library, there was already a fire in the grate and a plate of sliced lamb and vegetables on a side table. There was no, also no one there to thank. Pinkerton therefore pulled some books that she expected to need from the shelves, sat, and began to work. All right, and we will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful reading. Um, so if, a, if the idea of a queer lady, James Bond in 19th century England appeals to you as much as it appeals to me, uh, don't hesitate to get your copy of Heretic uh, Easter Pinkerton and the case of the Heretic Blood at the Spaniel's Tale using the links I provided in the chat and comments. Before I introduce our next reader, I do want to remind you that a little bit later uh, in the event, we will have a draw for some fabulous prizes. One of these prizes was donated by Jen and Eric de Mare from their generic, ooh, wow, from their generic coffee line. <laughs> yeah, backgrounds, eh? Um, this one is the Jack Coconil. Uh, line of coffee. It is a coconut flavored coffee and it is also Kennedy's favorite coffee uh, from Assassin's Accidental Matchmakers. So uh, to find out how to get your hands on this coffee, stay tuned. And now I will introduce our next reader. 
Um, you may already know the local author, SM Carriard. Uh, she has been uh, around the scene in Ottawa for a very long time. Um, and when she isn't brutally killing your favorite characters, she likes to spend her time teaching martial arts, live streaming video games, and occasionally teaching at the University of Ottawa, also cuddling her cat. In other words, she spends her time teaching others to kill, streaming her digital kills, teaching about historical death, and cuddling a furry murderer. Um, so SM Carrière will be reading today from her book, Human. Human is uh, uh, another book that is strong on the horror uh, with a little touch of romance. It is a book about vampires and mystery and a lot of that stuff. I'm going to introduce Sonia so that she can tell us just a little bit more about human and read us an excerpt. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along to this. I really appreciate it. Um, human is a vampire story. It follows uh, the prince of a vampiric house, Alexander Svetoslav, who was sent to America uh, in order to re-establish the vampiric foothold there, lost by a previous house, which has been razed to the ground by hunters. Uh, there is only one person in the world, in America, it seems, who believes in vampires. And I'm going to read you the part where they meet. So this is the start of chapter two. Alexander smiled slightly at the tall, lean figure in the ruined doorway. His strawberry blonde hair was cut short and his pale skin was covered in freckles that would not fade, no matter how well he stayed out of the sun. Like all the Okiri, the man had dark eyes. You are Lucan, I take it, Alexander said, extending a hand in greeting. Slowly, deliberately, the member of House Aspera took it and they shook. Welcome to what remains of House Ustral, Alexandra. Alexander turned and led the way into the smoke-stained foyer. Lucan wandered in slowly, hiding his eager eagerness to take stock of his surrounds and escape the hot sun. He tucked his sunglasses into his breast pocket. There is nothing left of House Ustral, he said easily. This is now House Spetislav, or are you proposing to change alliances? Theodore will always be my sire, Alexander murmured. He cocked his head at the stranger. You look hot. Would you like some ice water to cool you down? Lucan shook his head. Shook his head. I'm here on official business from the council. Yes, I know. Observation, I believe. Does the council think so little of me? They are, Lucan cocked his head. Cautious. Alexander did not reply. Instead, he picked up a broom and resumed sweeping the floor of the foyer. In the room behind what would eventually become the formal dining hall, Stoyan could be heard humming as he scrubbed the walls down with soap and water. You could hire contractors, Lucan noted. Is that the official position of the council? Alexander asked. Lucan smiled. Would it matter if it was? Likely not. Alexander sighed and put aside his broom. I'm afraid we do not have any accommodation for you yet. You were not expected until after I sent word to the council. I know. They decided not to wait. Lucan looked around. Where have you set up? In the dining hall, Alexander pointed. I'll bring my things through then. Alexander nodded. He watched Lucan gather his suitcases, which he had left by the door, and walk into the dining hall. He heard Stoyan stop, introduce himself, and then return to work. The gruffness of Stoyan's short introduction put a smile on Alexander's face. He reached for the broom and continued his cleanup. A few moments later, Lucan returned to the foyer. He had changed out of his suit into jeans and a shirt and carried a broad-headed broom. You don't need to, Alexander said as Lucan wordlessly began to sweep. The Aspera shrugged. I have done worse things than sweep the floor. Nodding, Alexander returned to work. Despite the mutual distrust between the two Opiri, they worked well together, clearing the foyer in a half day. The skip that stood just outside the front door in what used to be a flower bed before the fire was so full of debris it had begun to spill over. Alexander and Lucan were leaning on their brooms, looking at the foyer with satisfaction when a loud knock at the door turned their heads. Alexander scowled. He was not expecting visitors. I'll get it, Lucan said. He laid his broom against the graffiti-covered wall and walked to the door, opening it. He paused in surprise to see a policewoman and what Lucan assumed was a plainclothes detective standing before him. 
Good afternoon, he greeted slowly. The detective said nothing, staring at Luca with a pale face, so the woman spoke for him. Hi, she said brightly. Sorry to disturb you. I'm Officer Alicia Wilde. This is my partner, Detective Brody. We just dropped by on behalf of the city police to welcome you. Scowling, Lucan slowly stood aside. Please, he said. Come in. Impossibly tense, Detective Brody did not move until Officer Wilde pushed him roughly. He grunted and walked robotically into the foyer. He stopped dead when he saw Alexander, who still leant casually on his broom, awaiting his visitors. Hi! Alicia said as she moved to stand beside Brody. She smiled brightly at the man, leaning on the broom near the broken stairs. Alexander, Stoyan said as he marched into the foyer from the dining hall, covered in the filth of soot-laden soapy water. He stopped dead when he saw the police in the foyer. Detective Brody turned to him, stiffening yet more. You're not in trouble, Alicia said, flashing a smile to try and alleviate the sudden friction in the room. We just swung by to say hi. That is kind of you, Alexander said. He laid aside his broom and stepped forward, extending his hand. I am Alexander Svetoslav. Alicia took his hand and smiled. So you're the mysterious heir that has everyone talking. Raising his brows, Alexander said, I did not think my arrival would be cause for any gossip. Alicia shrugged. Things have been pretty quiet. There hasn't been much else to gossip about. She put her hand on Brody's shoulder. This is Detective Brody. Alexander turned to him and extended his hand. Detective Brody jerked away, taking a step back. Alexander raised his brows in surprise, though it was Alicia who looked the most shocked. She turned to her partner, her face collapsing into a deep scowl. Hey, she snapped. We're going, Brody said shortly. What, Alicia demanded, but gra Brody grabbed her arm. We're leaving, come on. He half dragged her from the foyer as quickly as he could. As she was pulled away, she turned back to Alexander. I'm sorry, she mouthed. Alexander nodded at her noting Lucan and Stoyan moving to his side as the policewoman was dragged outside. What the hell do you think you're doing? Alicia demanded of Brody once out of the house. She yanked herself from his grip. From his grip. <laughs> Brody did not answer as he stalked to the car. Hey, Brody, answer me. Get in the car, Brody stepped back, sliding into the driver's seat and, staring, and starting the engine. Alicia did, slamming the door hard to show her displeasure. In grim silence, Brody pushed the car out of neutral and fled the manse, tires screeching. Alexander watched from the door, Lucan standing at his shoulder. They said nothing as they watched the car vanish into the yew tree chunk tunnel. Who knows, Lucan said when the car vanished from sight. Yes, Alexander replied. And I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading, uh, SM Carrière. Again, uh, don't forget to get your copy of Human. You can get it at The Spaniel's Tale by walking in the store or by clicking the link that I put in the chat in the Facebook comments. All right, before we move on to our next book, we are going to have a little draw for that fabulous coffee. Um, and I can attest myself, I love these coffees. I am not generally a fan of, of sugar or of um, flavored coffees in general. And these coffees are just, just the perfect sort of subtle hint of flavor uh, that's not overpowering, but very, very, um, uh, yes. And as Talia would say, one must make sure it's not, there's not too blood, too much blood in my caffeine stream. I do need to keep a certain level of caffeine there. Uh, for myself. And I'm hoping that the winner of our prize is feeling the same way. So I am using calculator.net to just pick out a random number amongst the number of our participants. And I have drawn the number six, which on my screen is the person named just a letter J. Uh, so person who is named just a letter J, um, I will be Sending you a private message on Zoom with our email address. Please write me back with your mailing address so that you can claim your prize and I can just mail it to you. So congratulations, the letter J. <laughs> All right, so we will be moving on to our next book. Now, this is going to be a little bit longer because our next book is an anthology. It is actually the volume two of our Nothing Without Us anthology series. Nothing Without Us is a very special um, 
<clears throat> book series. It is a collection of multi-genre short stories by disabled authors featuring disabled main characters. Um, and their stories are not, uh, you know, it's definitely not what we call inspiration porn. It is definitely stories of, of triumph and, 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 all that good stuff. Before I go on, and um, I'm going to introduce our lovely editresses, um, <laughs> Kat Gordon and Talia Johnson. All right, so Kat Gordon is a um, an author, an autistic, disabled, and queer Canadian author of humorous speculative fiction that celebrates diversity. She is the author of Life in the Cosm, The Stealth Lovers, and Iris and the Crew Tear Truth Space, which is coming out in 2023. Her short stories appear in Alice Unbound, Beyond Wonderland, We Shall Be Monsters, Space Opera Libretti, and The Stargazers, Microtales from the Cosmos. Kat also founded the Spoonie Authors Network and joined Talia C. Johnson to co-edit the Nothing Without Us anthology, uh, the first volume of which was nominated for, uh, was actually a finalist for the P. Aurora Award. Um, the protagonists, as I said, are disabled, deaf, neurodivergent, Spoonie, and or they manage chronic illness and or mental illness. Um, she lives in Canada, Ontario. Kohenna Talia C. Johnson is a multifaceted woman who is transgender, autistic, Jewish, queer, and more than the sum of her parts. She was ordained a Kohenna priestess in August 2019, the first transgender woman in the program. Her work centers on bridging faith and queer communities, facilitating workshops, educating, speaking, writing, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and um, counseling and mentoring. Talia has worked as a sensitivity editor for queer and trans representation, and her poem, Holy Love, appears in the Resilience Anthology by HeartSpark Press. She, is also, she also sits on the executive uh, of the A4A Ontario, an autistic-led advocacy group, a self-advocacy group. Uh, Talia joined uh, Cad Gordon to co-edit Nothing Without Us and Nothing Without Us Too. She lives in Etobicoke, Ontario. So before I give the floor to Kat and Talia to introduce the participants who will be reading from uh, the story. I do want to show you the trailer just so that you get a sense of what, what this book is all about. And you'll, you'll see, you'll recognize some faces. There's such a broad range, I feel, of like bad disability rep. You are always the best friend. Tragic figures. The cautionary tale. Mental illness and horror. Just too many misconceptions and stereotypes about the disability community. It's incredibly important for all of us to see ourselves in stories. It helps people understand their own experiences. I wonder if I had access to good representation, how different my life would be. There's nothing quite as totally validating and affirming as finding a beloved character in a story that happens to share at least some of the aspects of your lived experience. But it's even more important for non-disabled people to be able to make those connections and practice empathy. There's almost no demographic in this world where there's not ableism. The majority of people do not care about me or people like me. What stories we read affect what we know about the world. Reading fiction helps people learn empathy. It enriches everybody involved. Having a book like Nothing Without Us and Nothing Without Us 2 that includes adults with disabilities living their lives, that's amazing. This particular series of anthologies is so critical. The authors are writing from a place of lived experience. The stories in this book they aren't afraid. Disabled people still stand up and show up for each other. The variety of experience is really what's important um, with a book like this. And I especially love that these are genre fiction collections, multi-genre, right? Because I feel like representation should be everywhere. No matter what your favorite genre is, there should be something. Kind of a retelling of the story of the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey. A woman who befriends the ghost that lives in her house. A uh, young mage who comes back to themselves after a period of being in an altered reality. 
a young girl going to trying to get a job. A really kind of introspective piece. Most of my stories are at least partially true. The worst resort in the world. They're, one of their online social media accounts is sort of uh, now magic. Uh, the anthology is just brilliant. It's so good. It's so good. And um, it just deserves to be read. Nothing Without Us 2, now with 100% more snark. Buy Nothing Without Us 2. Get your awesome from, from Nothing Without Us 2 and make you happy. This is why books like Nothing Without Us 2 are so important. Disabled authors don't just fix disability in their stories. They go about fixing, as it were, the entire world. Amanda Leduc, author of Disfigured, on fairy tales, disability, and making space, and The Centaur's Wife. From neurodivergent, accidental vampire slayers to Lady Macbeth with a tick, the disabled protagonists navigate real and speculative worlds with stories of crip agency, humor, and feisty finesse. Dorothy Ellen Palmer, disability activist, author of Kerfuffle, and winner of the Helen Henderson Award for Disability Journalism. Nothing Without Us 2. Get it at your local bookshop. Wow. Um, that trailer is so amazing. And I almost started to happy cry. And then I forgot that Sally has said, now with 100% more snark. <laughs> oh, that, um, I'm always terribly moved when I, this is the second trailer, as, as Nathan said, is our second book. And I'm always terribly moved by the trailers and hearing what the authors have to say. Um, one of the things that uh, Nathan asked Tally and myself was, what what was was it was there any significance for us doing this second anthology during the pandemic? What do you think, Brain? <laughs> By the way, I'm Pinky and Talia's Brain. Oh, geez, yeah, it, it you know we we seem to pick the greatest times to do these anthologies. Uh, and, you know, nothing like being locked. Well not locked down. I mean, the door locked and unlocked, so it wasn't fully locked all the time. Um, but with, with the world, you know, just in so much chaos and denial about reality. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're, you know, and it's still happening and it hasn't passed, um, you know, and it needs to keep going. It needs to keep going. And, and, and so do we as artists. And I, I think, um, there were so many layers. We wanted to call it nothing without a TOO because we thought we were oh so clever and we wanted to have a whole bunch of new authors. But when the pandemic came, shouting out nothing without us too had another layer of significance for us. And um, we also knew how difficult it was for many disabled neurodivergent folks to write, to create during the pandemic, because we were bombarded with a lot of eugenics-based messages like, oh, only the immunocompromised, only the disabled people will be affected. And so that kind of pushed us further to do this anthology. It's like, you know what? Nothing without us to, not only in the world, but also in fiction, you know, we're here, deal with it. And we were so thrilled with the, uh, with the stories that came in. And, you know, I always say anyone who is disabled, neurodivergent, managing mental illness, et cetera, who creates during this pandemic, they should all just be given awards because we understand how difficult that is to do. Um, but we're gonna now introduce three authors who are uh, local to Ottawa to, uh, to give uh, excerpts of their stories. And we're gonna begin with Erin Rockford. And Erin is an Ottawa-based author, therapist, and podcaster. She co-hosts the Brodacious Book Club Review Podcast and is a convention organizer for the Aurora Award-winning CanCon. Her work has been published by Translunar Travelers Lounge, that's a great title, and featured on Ephemera Reading Series. So welcome, Erin. Thanks, Kat. Um, I have my copy of the book right here. 
Um, and uh, yeah, uh, as you probably heard in the uh, trailer, uh, this is kind of a science fiction retelling of the story of the Lotus Eaters from the Odyssey. Um, and it's also about uh, people with various <laughs> mental illness stuff getting exploited by uh, corporations. Spoiler alert, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the, the beginning and hopefully that will entice you to pick up this anthology because it's great. Um, so uh, yeah, the story is called Lament of the Lotus Eater. Welcome to Blomst Wellness Incorporated. We are the galaxy's number one stop for mental health resources and services. Here at our Milky Way headquarters, we are hard at work making sure that you get the very best care professionals and the most empirically backed treatment to make sure you get back to feeling you. What can I assist you with today? Customer reply, me? I am the cybernetic building manager. It's my job to make sure you get where you need to go and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Customer reply, are EAP services? Certainly, elevator is to your left and don't worry, it's programmed to take you directly where you need to go. I hope your time here is pleasant and productive. Welcome to Blomst Wellness Incorporated. What can I help you with today? Customer reply, I am the cybernetic building manager. I keep everything running smoothly here. If you have any questions, customer reply. No, I'm not a robot. Do I look like a thoughtless automaton? Customer reply. Well, I'm not. I am a cybernetically enhanced human able to interface with the system. I'm an employee on contract with BWI. Customer reply. Yes, of course I'm a person. What kind of a question? My apologies. What can I assist you with today? Customer reply. Well, that's just rude. Welcome to Blomst Wellness Incorporated, your number one stop for mental health resources. What can I, customer reply. Who is Emerson? Customer reply. No, I'm sorry, you must be mistaken. I'm not Emerson. I'd remember if that was my name and I'm afraid I don't recognize you. Customer reply. You must have me confused with someone else. BWI employs a number of excellent people. Customer reply, R&D, right. I've called the elevator. It will take you there directly. Could you tell me? My apologies. Have a pleasant and productive visit. My name isn't Emerson. My name is, it's, you remember a bed. You remember sheets dank with your own sweat time lost to the all-consuming nothingness. You don't want to be here, but nothing can rouse you. Your body feels weighted down, like it would take superhero strength to even raise your head. You're hungry, you think, but food repels you. Your stomach churns as though it's full of angry eels. The thought of eating, of trying to chew through screaming teeth and swallow down a hair-trigger throat, kills any real desire. Beyond the bed, beyond the ravening hunger, beyond the repulsion, beyond the creaking of your ribs and the storm of your thoughts is nothing. No one is looking for you. No one is missing you. You, always too weird, too queer, too awkward, too embarrassing. No one wants you around anyway. Better to stay here. Better to not exist at all. And over to you, Talia. <laughs> and on right, that okay, cheery folks. note, <laughs> it is a wonderful story. I highly recommend you get the book it's and fantastic. read it. Love it. Um, um, also, um, like uh, Sonia's book, ours does have a story about a vampire, except the context is a little bit different. What happens when a vampire walks into a convenience store? Next up to read is Jen Demarais. Um, Jen is the creator of the sex education game Blush, co-author of Assassin's Accidental Matchmakers, which we heard from earlier, and author of the upcoming Crushing It in Spring 2023, also to be published by Renaissance. Co-founder of Jen Eric Designs. Uh, it's important. It's G-A-E-N-E-R-I-C. Um, 
She creates unique geeky crocheted items. Her blogs, The Traveling Tardis and How I Taught My Dragon have been nominated for the Pre-Aurora Awards over the past five years. She lives in Ottawa with her author, hus author husband, not husband, author, as I was about to read, daughter, son, and their library of over 3,000 books. Jen. Hi, um, I guess I'm reading again. <laughs> so this character is a background character from Assassins. Um, you'll see Kennedy pop up in this. And they work at a boutique lingerie store. Claudia sighed and sat on a bench, stretching her long legs out. She grimaced at her stomach. So what do you think, stomach? Should I eat lunch today? She paused. I should. It's good for me to eat regularly. She thought about the cafeteria and its variety of restaurants and wrinkled her nose. It wasn't that the texture of the food didn't appeal to her. She didn't quite understand why she felt this way about food, just that she did. When she first noticed her weight start to drop, her lifeguarding shorts had still buttoned without a problem, but she'd worried that she had an eating disorder. I don't look in a mirror and feel like I'm too fat, so I'm not anorexic. I don't vomit up my food after eating when I eat, so bulimia doesn't describe me either. Claudia shook her head in frustration and got to her feet. Do I really need to eat? She frowned at the fake plant beside the bench. Yes, I do. It's not good to skip meals. Stop, thief! The voice broke her stream of consciousness and she saw a man running towards her, holding a purse tight to his chest. She had a split second to decide, and she stuck her foot out. The man tripped, falling face first onto the hard floor. Bitch, I think you broke my nose, he cried out, one hand over his bloody chin. Maybe you shouldn't steal from people then, Claudia snarked back. She scooped up the familiar looking purse, her gaze catching on the clump of costume bears at one end and handed it to the security guard that jogged up to her. Hey Cliff, exciting day? Unfortunately. He picked up he picked the screaming man up by the elbow. Thanks for the assist, Claudia. Swing by after your shift ends. I'll need a written statement. Not a problem. Claudia dug a pen out of her purse and scrawled a memo to herself on her hand. She was walking into discreet frills when she remembered she hadn't had lunch. Balls. Oh well, I'll be fine. Guess what, Chicky? I helped catch a purse snatcher. Awesome. Weren't you supposed to be eating? Kennedy asked, looking up from the desk. I'll eat after my shift, Claudia said, waving a hand dismissively. I feel like a warrior. You are one. Come tell me all about it while you pick out what you want to model on Saturday. There, I unmuted myself. Technology, it's our friend. Thank you so much for that reading, Jen. <laughs> Sorry about our quirk. Yeah, thanks. And you know, the 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 thing about not eating is also a neurodivergent thing. You know, one of the jokes in autistic and ADHD community is that we remind each ask each other if we've eaten today yeah. or if we're staying hydrated because it's very easy to forget to eat all day. Yeah, and we actually thought that that was a, a unique way to represent disordered eating, um, and that's why we chose that story for our anthology. Tally and I are always texting, have you eaten yet? So that uh, appealed to us. Um, our final reader for the anthology is NRM Roshak. NRM Roshak is an award-winning Canadian author and translator. Their stories have appeared in various anthologies and magazines, including Galaxies SF, Daily Science Fiction, and Future Science Fiction Digest, and have been translated into three languages. While they don't identify as disabled, their lived experience has made them an ally. Chronic health issues have kept them from working at various points in their adult life, and they've shaped their life and work around what their health allows. They're both grateful to have meds that work right now and keenly aware that their, quote, abled, unquote, status could change at any time. Welcome. Thank you for the great intro, Kate and Talia. I was super, super excited to be in this anthology. 
I'm going to read a few minutes of my story in it, which is called Orange Rope for Sale. It's got a couple of content notes, uh, depression, breakup, and suicidal ideation, although I think the only one we'll actually get to is the breakup. So, Orange Rope for Sale. April 1st, 11.41 a.m. YouSellStuff.com, Sporting Goods and Exercise Equipment Other. Dynamic rope for mountain climbing, orange, $50, posted today, Ottawa, Ontario, K1R7W0. Details. It's a rope. My ex wanted to get into climbing. It was a disaster, but maybe it'll be fine for you. Things I know about this rope. It is orange. It is long. We used it once. It did not break, unlike our relationship. Contact seller, Angela. Next item. Exercise weights, $100. Posted today, Ottawa, Ontario, K1R7W0. Details. Weights. Dumbbells, two at 10 pounds, two at five pounds, two, two and a half pounds. One bar, barbells, six, 10 pounds, six, five pounds, two, two and a half pounds. Used. Good condition, works fine. I'm just done trying. Contact seller, Ben. April 1st, take two, 1141 AM. YouSellStuff.com, sporting goods and exercise equipment, other. Dynamic rope for mountain climbing, reposting, orange, $50. Posted today, Ottawa, Ontario. K1R7W0. Details. I know I posted this yesterday along with everything else my ex left behind, but it's all gone from the website today? Anyway, I'm still trying to sell this rope. If you tried to message me about it yesterday, sorry, but please try again. This rope costs more than $150 and we only used it once. It's orange, long, and it was there for me when I fell off a mountain, which is more than I can say for my ex. Well, I'm done with him and with climbing. Someone, please buy this rope from me. Also, please check my other listings, which I just spent hours re-entering. And if this website eats all my listings tomorrow, I will put them in again. I don't care how many days I have to spend in front of my computer. I want his junk out of my life. His literal junk, I mean, not his junk junk which left with him obviously and I will keep posting his stuff until it's gone contact seller Angela next item exercise weights $100 or best offer posted today Ottawa Ontario K1R7W0 details weights dumbbells two ten pounds two five pounds two two and a half pounds one bar barbells six ten pounds six five pounds two two and a half pounds Sorry if I listed this twice, thought I put this up last night, but can't find it today and no messages. The set is in great condition. The problem is M-E. I will never have the energy to lift again. Contact seller, Ben. April 1st, take three, 11.39 a.m. YouSellStuff.com, sporting goods and exercise equipment, other. Exercise weights, free. Posted today, Ottawa, Ontario, K1R7W0. Details. Weights. Dumbbells, two 10 pounds, two five pounds, two two and a half pounds. One bar barbells, six 10 pounds, six five pounds, two two and a half pounds. So, since I listed this yesterday, I figured out two things. One, everything I did yesterday goes away when I wake up. For the last two days, gone. Two, I can't leave my apartment. I get about one meter outside my door and wham, like hitting a wall. I guess by now everyone else has discovered it too. They are calling it the 10 meter bubble. You can only go 10 meters from where you were on April 1st at 10.40 a.m. Well, I was sitting at home on the computer, so guess that's where I'm staying. What's funny is it took me two days to figure it out because I never leave the apartment. Used to go jogging every day, but now CFS says no. No energy to lift either, so these weights are useless and I'm sick of looking at them. If you happen to live 10 meters from my apartment, come get him. Contact seller, Ben. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. It's so fun for us to experience these stories again. Uh, I remember laughing out loud when, when we were, remember when we were just going through the slush pile and we just thought this was just so great. <laughs> So yay, thank you very much. Thanks you to our readers. And um, I guess we're gonna, what are we gonna do now? I think we're going to 
Nathan, do you have a link in the chat? Yes, I see it there. There's so a link in the chat. Uh, don't yeah. forget to pick it up from the span uh, the spaniel's tail, um, definitely. And yeah, and you and you don't have to buy one copy for each story in the anthology, although that would be appreciated. I mean, you know, if you feel like buying twenty seven copies, be free. <laughs> Absolutely, it's highly encouraged. <laughs> thank um, you so much. Thank you, thank you. And before we move on to um, to the next part, I do want to do another draw. First of all, our participant, um, the letter J, disconnected right after they won the prize. So I have redrawn a name. So the winner, the actual winner of the delicious coconut coffee is Diana Gibbons. Diana Gibbons, I will be sending you a private message on the Zoom with our email address if you want to send us your mailing address so I can mail you this delicious coffee. Another little prize that I kept as a surprise to the end is the very first book of Nothing Without Us. I'll put it in front of my face. Maybe it'll work. Yes, it does. Nothing Without Us, the original Nothing Without Us, with um, the, I have a story in there, actually. Um, and this one is just as good as Nothing Without Us 2. And they are companions, of course. They are short stories. So you don't need to read both, although it will definitely enrich your life if you do. All right. So the next person yes carolyn uh is right you will love the coffee it's especially tasty i will also be dropping a link for a uh, generics coffee shop in as soon as i'm done talking in the um zoom chat and on facebook in the comments uh, so be sure to check that out as well uh, in the meantime i will pick our winner for the um for the nothing without us original edition our winner is Robert Runt. So I will be sending you a direct message, Robert, with uh, our email address. If you want to send us your mailing address, I will mail you your copy of Nothing Without Us. Congratulations to our winners. Excellent. Now, it's coming up upon that time of the year where, you know, the days start getting shorter and snow starts falling and we cozy up with our books uh, next to something hot to drink or eat. And, you know, we gather with our friends to celebrate the return of the light or whichever occasion you celebrate during this time of year. And I would like for uh, everyone uh, for authors to let us know we'll do a little bit of a round table to let us know what is your favorite food and or drink for this season so i'm actually going to uh start with because they were the last to read i'm going to start with nrm roshak so i'm going to add a spotlight here what is your favorite holiday food and or drink Oh, that's not even hard, Nathan. It is eggnog. I love eggnog. Soy nog, I'm lactose intolerant. Eggnog, uh, almond nog, anything nog. That's amazing. I, I will have this weird admission. Um, eggnog is not a big thing in French Canada and French Canadian. I have, to this day, I'm 41 years old. I've never tasted eggnog. I do not even know what it tastes like. And every year I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And it's been about three years that I've like, okay, this year I'm tasting eggnog. And it's been about three years that I've just been celebrating Christmas alone with my immediate family at home for whatever reason. You know what you got to get it as a French Canadian? It's because the French word for it is le de poule, right? I know. I know. It's amazing. I love it. Fried milk of the chicken. Chicken milk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Ooh, almond milk eggnog. That sounds delicious, actually. Mm -hmm. All right, Jen and Eric, do you want to tell us what is your favorite holiday food and or drink? Go ahead. So my favorite holiday food is the uh, Scottish shortbread made from my grandmother's recipe, um, which I recently received 
as like an heirloom recipe. And it really, that it just, it makes me think of her and her sneaking me a bite at Christmas. And yeah. Uh, I'm going to cheat and say two things. Uh, one, I finally was able to recreate a couple of years ago my mother's tortilla recipe, which, mm, tortilla. But I, I, that's kind of cheating because I've stopped making it just for Christmas. I make it all year round. So it's a really easy lunch for the kids. <laughs> And the second would be the brown sugar cookies Jen makes at Christmas, which oh. are so yummy. I do enjoy Tosia. My favorite Tosia is Tosia du Lac Saint Jean, which is a very Quebec thing. I know it's very different from you, Tosia. It's very chunky and a deep dish kind of thing and delicious. With potato? Mm -hmm. With potato, which is a forbidden food for me but I still have it because potatoes. Erin, what is your favorite holiday food and or drink? Uh, for drink, um, I will admit to having a deep um, fondness for candy cane hot chocolate and specifically like white candy cane hot chocolate, which is just pure sugar. Uh, but I, there's just something about that that like is very holiday themed to me. Um, and then for food, I don't know if I have a specific um, like food item but I, I just have always loved the element of like gathering in groups where everyone has brought food and there is so much food <laughs> that's <laughs> it's a quantity over specific quality for me in that situation <laughs> I definitely understand that uh big big spreads with potlucks are my favorite kind of mm -hmm. get together too uh, it's yeah it's very yes. very nice yes. And you're, you're talking about your hot chocolate candy cane. And it reminds me, uh, one of the things that I loved was my grandmother would always buy a box of those little chocolate mints called After Eights. Oh, yes. And those were so associated with Christmas in my mind. It just <laughs> is associable. Oh, uh, yeah, those are good. Yeah. All right. I will move on to Talia. Talia, what is your favorite holiday food and or drink? So this is one of those decision things. And um, one of my things is with food is that my food stuff changes sometimes seemingly daily. So favorites can come and go on a whim. Um, you know, for Hanukkah, latkes are always good, um, you know, with applesauce or sour cream and also sufka niyot, which are a type of donut. Those are just decadent uh, when they're done well. And when they're not done well, they're still good because fried dough in, yeah, it's it's a wonderful thing. For beverage, it varies. I'm I'm not sure what my favorite is right now. The one in front of me. <laughs> I go with that. That's very you know whatever funny. that happens to be at the time. Yeah, latkes are so delicious. I mean, fried dough and potatoes, both things. They're just you can't go wrong with those, right? Kat, what about you? What is your favorite holiday food and or drink? I stunned myself a little on this one over the years because uh, I'm Irish. My husband is Scottish. And so for him, I started to celebrate uh, Hogmanay, which is, the, uh, is New Year's Eve. And then I fell in love with the food of Hogmanay, like steak pie and tatties and neeps. But my favorite is the dessert, Kranikin, which <laughs> I always say, release the Kranikin every year. And it's this combination of whipped cream, and you can do coconut whipped cream if you can't handle moo moo milk, um, whipped cream and fresh raspberries and a little bit of roasted oats and a little bit of, I, I, I put like maple syrup because, hey, we are in Canada. Um, the Scots actually put whiskey, but I'm a teetotaler, so I can't have that. But just like this kind of combination of raspberries and whipped cream and maple syrup. Oh, I love it so hard. So that, that's what I like. Um, and I actually don't drink a lot of various drinks. I'm kind of a water drinker. I, mean, I like smoothies. So that's all year round. But I would say, yeah, the Kranikin, uh, sorry, the, the Hogmanay meal is, uh, that's okay. That is okay. I dig it. Nice. And for now, uh, from now on, I'm only calling milk Moo Moo Milk. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. All right, 
SM Carrier, what about you? Uh, I'm a sucker for hot beverages, specifically hot buttered be beverages. So I would love a hot buttered rum or a hot buttered ale. It's so good when you're coming in from a cold walk. It's just so good. <laughs> that is delicious. Hot beverages are the best. Evan, what about you? Yeah, I'm also going to mention a hot beverage. Uh, the last few years, I've been enjoying making uh, my version of uh, a medieval hot drink called a Hippocras at my house, um, which would have been uh, a wine with uh, spices added and some sugar added and then kind of heated slowly all day. So kind of like a mulled wine thing. And you can do a non-alcoholic version as well. And it would have been for, for most households because of the spice and because of the sugar, it would have been pretty expensive. So it was a treat. But the other thing that I like about it was that um, on at times like Christmas, you would start up a batch of this and members of the community would come by your house and share a, a cup of the Hippocras that you were that you were kind of brewing up. And, and I like that kind of community aspect of it as well. So I've been I've been doing my version of that the last little while. And that's that's worked out pretty well. Amazing. Thank you. Mold wine is one of my favorite things ever. And we are just joined right now by our last author, Elizabeth Hurst. So I will first, before I read her bio, since we're having this brilliant discussion, I'm just going to ask you, what is your favorite holiday drink and or food? Oh, wow. Um, so favorite holiday drink is probably cranberry ginger ale. <laughs> I know that's a little basic, but I just love it. And I mix it with other fruit juices and it's really fun. Um, I really like mixing ginger ale with different things and making little punches. Um, and also um, I really enjoy these little veggie pizzas that my aunt makes with um, phyllo pastry and um, cream cheese and cheese and uh, um, broccoli and cauliflower. So yeah, um, those would have to be my favorite holiday foods, I think. And uh, yeah, sorry, it was a bit late. Um, I'm, I'm in a musical this weekend. So if my brain is a little elsewhere also, I'm just in the kitchen at the theater actually. <laughs> This is amazing. And we are very, very glad that you could join us today, despite your incredibly busy schedule of being a musical superstar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <All> <laughs> oh, right. I'm in the chorus. I'm not exactly a superstar, but uh, I do have a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to read um, uh, Elizabeth Spio. Uh, so as you've heard, she's also a, an international superstar in the musical. <laughs> but uh, she is uh, also a uh, an author from Hamilton, who, uh, sorry, Distant Early Warning was the first volume in this series, uh, and this is The Ground That Grows Roses, which is the second volume in the series. Um, she is also the author of The Face in the Marsh, which is a very spooky um, queer horror uh, book set in small town Ontario. You will see that small town Ontario is a very popular location for Elizabeth. Before you go and read a little bit of your book, mm -hmm. uh, I am going to show us the trailer for volume one. Yay!
Okay, so that was the trailer for Distant Early Warning. Um, and Elizabeth, you'll be reading from the second book in the series called The Ground That Grows Roses. And it follows a little bit the theme, although Distant Early Warning has a very satisfying ending. Uh, it does follow the story and the theme of the characters while adding a few more complications to uh, to this world. So we have a very a little bit of a spooky story uh, about climate change uh, set in Ontario. So without further ado, Elizabeth, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, how long do I have for the reading? Let's say five minutes to seven. Okay, minutes. great. So I'm just going to start from the second chapter, um, The Ghost of the Troubadour, which introduces us to Tessa, who is the antagonist of the, the book. Um, Denny ends up reckoning with a very angry young girl who also has the same powers as her. Uh, so this introduces Tessa. Tessa picked the dirt out from underneath her pinky nail, then scraped it along the groove in the desk again. Ms. Grayval strode down the road toward her, a stack of papers in her arms, the fairy tale assignment. She could already tell by the way Ms. Grayval was stealing furtive, excited glances at her that there was news. She hit another one out of the park. Great. All the others she'd been having to read in front of the class, ignoring Snickers from Sandy and the rest of the girls sleeping with the football team. What were they doing in writer's craft anyway? They were all about as deep as rain slick on pavement. This time though, she dug deep. She might as well have written it in blood. Not that they'd get it, but she knew what it meant and that was enough. So why had she handed it in? Because it was good. It was so good, it deserved to be seen. It deserved to have a life, even if it just floated around a classroom for a few minutes, banging against the heads of a few morons. And said the small part of her that still hoped, there was always the chance, slim as it was, that someone else in that room would be able to read her code, that they would come up to her afterward, lay their hand on her shoulder and tell her they had heard the real story beneath the story. But they all spoke a different language. They spoke happy. She only spoke Tessa and Tessa wasn't happy. Tessa was beautiful and haunting and surprising. Tessa was wise and complex and different, just not happy. Ms. Grayball handed back her paper with a knowing smile. She had warm, dark eyes and beautiful thick eyelashes that made Tessa, with her washed out blue eyes and thin Dutch blonde hair, wish she, wish she had a bit more substance. Then again, one didn't gain much substance on breakfast of half moldy bread and margarine. Tessa looked down at her paper. In Mrs. Grayball's loopy handwriting, she read, incredible work, Tessa, A plus. Then further down, may I present this to my adult education class on Thursday night? I think a lot of my students could learn from your example. See me after class smiley face. She felt the blood rush to her cheeks in spite of herself. Ms. Grayball might not know all of it, but she had felt something. Tessa had made her feel something. She just wondered now if it was the right thing. Ms. Grayball had assigned her, had regained her usual position, perched primly at the front of the classroom, but her eyes had not left Tessa. We've had some wonderful, wonderful work submitted for this assignment. Those of you who got A's should feel very proud of yourselves. I was especially moved by Tessa's story, and I think she should be the first to share with the group today, she said, hand outstretched. Well, nothing for it now. Tessa pushed away from her desk, giving herself a moment to recover from her lightheadedness. People thought she was drunk a lot, but nope, just dead tired. Protecting your valuables from addicts make you, makes you a light sleeper pretty quickly. She reached the front of the room, only now aware as she raised the paper up to read it that she had crumpled one side and sweated all over it already. Part of Miss Graywall's note had smeared. So much for mementos of success. The ghost and the troubadour, she began. Just so everyone can keep up, Miss Graywall cut in. A troubadour is a bard or wandering minstrel, a medieval musician. She nodded to Tessa to continue. Tessa stifled an eye roll. How did Miss Graywall put up with this idiocy on a daily basis? Let them flounder in all the big words. Let them see how dumb they really were, then maybe they'd really start learning. After a pause, she began in earnest. There was once a great lady who lived in a castle in a valley just beyond where the sun sets at night. She was a smart woman and beautiful, but no one ever saw her intelligence or beauty for her husband kept her locked away in a room with no windows. Her husband was a cruel, greedy man and the lady's goodness and wisdom only ever served to make him look foolish in front of his friends and servants. One night, the Lord of the Manor brought her out to a ball forbidding her to speak upon pain of death lest her sharp wit make him look weak in front of his vassals. The Lord trod on her shoes during the dance many times, but she held her tongue. 
He kicked her favorite hound hard enough to make it yelp, but still she remained silent. Then at dinner, her husband's servant, her husband's servant passed her a glass of wine. She could smell that the drink was poisoned. Her husband commanded her to drink and seeing her fate clearly for the first time, she stood in front of all his guests and said, no, it is poison, you drink it. Her husband knocked the wine to the ground and mocked her before the guests. Then that very night, he walled her up in her closed closet and she was never seen alive again. Tessa trembled a little through her core and struggled to keep her hands steady so the others wouldn't notice. They saw your fear, they attacked. That's what had happened every time with dad. He'd seen her fear and fed off it. And uh, then I'm going to switch over, I'm going to uh, skip over this part, uh, possibly triggering child abuse. She took a breath back in the here and now and continued her story. Yes, the lady was never seen alive again, but her spirit remained in the castle wandering the battlements in the evening and sitting alone at ghostly feasts in the dining hall in her decaying finery, entertaining herself as best she could with no one to keep her company. She had forgotten the manner of her death and the location of her body, as is the way with ghosts. Her former husband drove the kingdom into debt and ruin with his stupidity. Then, after some drunken words with a neighboring lord, he entered into a foolish war and the castle was destroyed. The land itself passed from hand to hand, but ultimately was abandoned as well. Still, people spoke in hushed tones over the dying embers of their fires, of the lady who dwelt in the ancient ruins in the valley beyond the sunset. One day, a bard entered the lady's domain, stopping to rest in the castle ruins. He had eaten and rolled out his bed, and he made a small fire in the hall's great hearth and began to play his lute. He sang of the country of his birth, a beautiful place on the sea coast near a great harbor, which had been torn apart by war. His patron, the king, had sent him to sing of the tiny kingdom's plight to gather what aid he might. So far, he had found no one willing to help them, and so he had come to the lady's castle, for he was fond of his homeland and would do anything to help them, including invoking forbidden magics. As he played his lute, the lady emerged from the shadows, clad in the tatters of her finery, still as solid and as real looking as any living being. The bard continued to play, and she sat and listened. A tear ran down her ghostly cheek as he described the horrible things he had seen the families torn apart and the beautiful land defiled. Tessa pictured Lorian playing his guitar on stage whenever she read the scene over to herself, no matter how hard she tried to put it into a medieval setting. Something about the way his long hair spilled over his face while he played entranced her. His music was magical. It was all about Hamilton and her life, although maybe he didn't know it. The lady howled as only ghosts can, despairing at being trapped in the decaying castle forever. She wanted to help the bard and do what she might to comfort him. The bard, sensing the source of her sorrow, said, you are a ghost because you still have life and talent to give the world. If I release you, you will be free to pursue your destiny. But beware, freedom comes at a terrible cost. There will come a day when the darkness inside of you, the blackness of the pit that your murder planted and grew will escape and you will have to battle it. Woe betide us if you should lose. I don't care, said the lady. Free me and I shall conquer even the stars in return. The bard nodded. He tuned his lute to a seldom used key and played a song, strange and dissonant, in another language that only ghosts understood. The song told the lady where her body was hidden and in what manner she died. As she remembered, flames of anger and hatred erupted around her, burning the invisible bonds which held her to the castle ruins. She ran to the crumbling gate and stepped over the threshold. She was free, but with that freedom, she felt something rising up inside her, struggling to get out like a noxious worm in a cocoon. For the first time since her death, she felt afraid of what might happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful reading. I love that uh, excerpt from the book. Uh, the short story always gets to me every time. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I do, um, we, we are reaching the end of our event. I want to first of all thank all of our wonderful authors for their readings. Uh, they were fantastic, everyone. Very fascinating. Um, I want to thank our public for coming, joining us on the call, watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Congratulations again to the winners. And don't forget to write me your addresses. I see that at least one of them has written. So thank you very, very much for this. Um, but most of all, I want to thank our fabulous and fantastic host today, uh, the Spaniel's Tale Bookshop. They are a phenomenal bookshop. Uh, I've had the privilege of visiting them this week 
for uh, to uh, just drop off some books, and I could not resist buying a couple of titles myself. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful bookshop on the corner of Wellington, and I think Rosemount, um, right around that uh, there. It's just gorgeous. You have to step in and take a look, but also you can uh, shop safely from their website. Uh, don't forget to get all of your books directly from them. Um, and you'll see that they have a huge selection of very, very good and diverse titles. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for books like this, um, absolutely step into The Spaniel's Tale. It is worth, uh, worth going over there and seeing for yourself. All right. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. Uh, don't forget to shop at The Spaniel's Tale, and I hope you have a fabulous, fabulous holiday season. Um, I think it is very much not too late to order your books for holiday presents. They make fantastic presents, uh, of course. I'm always giving books to all of my family and friends um, because, you know, they make great things, and then you can write a little note to really personalize them. And I'm sure that if you order ahead at the Spaniel's Tale, uh, maybe we can even arrange for one of our authors to drop by and sign a book, you know? All right. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you to the Spaniel's Tale. Thank you to the authors, and thank you for the audience for this fabulous afternoon. And see you around next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>